recording. Yes, it did. <laughs> so thanks, Nobuto. So Nobuto is a student of Kunikaneko, an old friend in Tokyo. Uh, this whole field of, of complexity has exploded in the last 30 years, and it's wonderful. Strangely enough, I think there's, there's a way in which we're going beyond it. So my brazen title is, that I'm going to say two things today. I'm quite confident of the, the first one. I do think we're the third transition in science. Work I've done with Andrea Rowley, um, paper in press now with uh, Journal of the Royal Society Interface. And I think there's a fourth law of thermodynamics where entropy decreases. I'm less sure of that. It's all very strange. So please, seriously, third apart. It may be right and we may be wrong. So here it is. The overview is a third transition in science beyond the first, Newton, the second, quantum mechanics, and centrally, the Newtonian paradigm, which I'll get back to. My claim with Andre is we cannot explain the evolution of the biosphere using physics alone. We need physics, but that's not, not enough. And no law at all entails the ever creative evolution of the biosphere. I think the vast creativity is due to a new fourth law where the entropy of the universe decreases. This is totally strange, but I think it's true. The first mathematical expression of this fourth law is the theory of the adjacent possible tap equation, which is visible on my shirt because my wife made it for me. And it says down here, the theory of everything else. This is so we have something to do when the physicists have done it all. Okay, so everything above is in press or published. Um, okay. So I'm going to take us through wonderful images that Jan Dijkster House made in Holland. This is a fungus with bacteria growing along it. I want to show you this one. Fungi and bacteria have been on this planet for several billion years. Um, what, what happens now is that worms crawl around in the fungi and eat them. But it turns out the fungi are not helpless. I love this. So the fungi have evolved something called a gun cell. When the, back, when the worm swims by, the fungus shoots a small molecular harpoon into the worm and pulls itself inside the worm and eats it from the inside. So what you're looking at is a, uh, oh, I can't do that. The worm is there and it's dead and eaten and it's surrounded by fungi. And what I want you to think about, particularly the physicists in the room with your Lagrangians, could you start from the beginning of the universe and deduce the coming to exist in the universe, that. So I want to distinguish between a synchronic analysis of what's around and the diachronic now analysis of what comes to exist in the universe. And our claim will be, you cannot deduce the evolving bias here. So I'm just gonna, so that's just pretty, it's a sporulating fungus. So I want to get to the possibility of a fourth law but it's a very strange fourth law. It's for non-ergotic systems that construct from inside themselves their expanding phase space. In statistical mechanics, there's a liter box of gas. The phase space is fixed forever. So we'll get to that. To do this, I'm going to discuss the theory of the adjacent possible, which is this lovely equation. But I actually, it's the only equation I've written down. Um, and it does all kinds of surprising things. Here's how it came about several years ago. Uh, I was wondering, could you write an equation for the number of goods in an economy? If you have, I, I guess I can't use the pointer here. If you have mt goods at time t, like 40 goods, how many goods will you have the next discrete period? And the thought is, well, if these 40 things are working, you'll have them in the next period. But what about all the things you can make out of the 40 things by taking one thing at a time and modifying it, like changing an, an accent? Or what about, what about taking a pair of things and making something new, like the printing press from a wine press and movable type, or three things, or four things like the Wright Brothers airplane, which is a recombination of an airfoil, a gas engine, propeller, and bicycle wheels. So here's the equation. I want to have 40 things and take all single things when I is a one, all pairs of things when I is two, all triples of things when I is three. So this is mt choose i running from the sum i is equal to one up to mt. 
And alpha I is one way of saying it's getting harder and harder to make things. You try to do it out of more and more things. So this term decreases. And in the form of alpha to the I, this is a half. Uh, alpha to the one is a half. Alpha to the two is a quarter. Then an eighth. So it decreases exponentially in that form. So that's the equation. And alpha is between zero and one. It does very surprising things. Um, it, it predicts three independent distributions, a hockey stick, a slow increase, then an explosion in the number of things, a hockey stick, then an a gradual increase and an explosion in the complexity of things. And quite astonishingly, it predicts a power law descent distribution in patents. And it also predicts the accelerating pace of technological evolution, which is pretty good for one equation. And we need to see this. I'm going to present this to you, then use it. What grounds do we have to actually take this equation seriously? So that's basically what I'm showing you now. Roger Koppel led us to look at the uh, at GDP per capita over the last 2,000 years. And there's some wondrous things to say. This probably goes back 20,000 years. Per capita GDP was constant. And starting about 200 years, it's exploded upward. So it's a hockey stick. Notice that this has gone up from 1,000 to 14,000. It's going up almost vertically on a finite planet, right? Can it keep going up? Not on a finite planet. This is also the Anthropocene, but that's the hockey stick. In, and we believe that the increase in per capita is income. Is be, we are creating an increasing diversity of goods. So it is true that the number of goods that we're trading, cambio diversity in Roger's terms, has exploded to billions of things now from a few hundred thousand a long time ago and a few tens of whatever in the times of the Cro-Magnon. This is the first account in the increase in the number of things. And here's what our theory does, made into a mathematical model of economic growth. The theory gives rise to an explosion in the number of things. Second, it's also a hockey stick in the complexity of things. Reinterpret MT as the most complex thing created at time t. If mt is 40, the most complex thing has 40 parts. So this theory simultaneously predicts a hockey stick in the number of things and a hockey stick in the increase in complexity of things. Well, that's true. Australopithecus 2.6 million years ago had a few crude stone tools. Cro-Magnon had maybe 40 or 50 things ranging from uh, uh, spear points to the, the, the wonderful at level. Uh, in Mesopotamia, there's a few thousand things ranging from needles to the chariot. And we now have billions of things ranging from the needle to the space station. You can't make, you can't make a crossbow until you make a bow. You can't make a space station until you make rockets. So this thing seems to fit that. Third, um, here is work by Sergi Valverde. He's looked at something like 3 million patents between 1815 and, 2000, 1850 and 2010. For every patent, you know its antecedents, the patent site's prior art. Therefore, from every patent, you can just see it's, who its children are and the grandchildren, great-grandchildren. So for every patent, you could say, how many kids and grandkids do you have? This is an analysis of literally 3 million patents, and it's power law, slope minus 1.3. Well, okay, that's neat. But here's what TAP predicts. It predicts the power law and the number of descendants. And the slope ranges from minus 1 to 1.35 as you change parameters. So the th same theory, I find this really strange, is predicting the descent distributions of patents. And patents are ideas. They're not building blocks that have to be useful in the world. And finally, um, this is a theorem due to physicists. Uh, Andrew Little, and he proved for this thing, every time you add a new item, the waiting time for the next new item, it is cut in half. But this is the Anthropocene. A, a case in point is my own father, who was born in 1903, the year flight was invented by the Wright brothers. My son was born 66 years later when we landed on the moon by an entirely different technology, rockets. That's 66 years. How much technological change happened 50,000 years ago in 66 years? And the answer is nothing. So Andrew has shown that the same equation tells us why it is that the future is rushing at us 
ever more rapidly. That's pretty good for one equation. I'm going to want to say those are grounds to think that it's somehow right or something telling us something important. So I'm going to use it now. About two years ago, Marina Cortez and Andrew and Lee Smolin, Lee invented uh, loop quantum gravity. Andrew and Marina are cosmologists. And, and Marina said, this tap thing, there's something important going on. And there's at least one physicist in the room. So here's the problem. It's the measure of the complexity of the abiotic universe is a number E raised to the 10 raised to the 124th by various and different means. Marina led us to create biocosmology. It's a fascinating question Marina asked. It's not astrobiology. It's what is the implication for cosmology itself of the fact that life exists? So Marina and Andrew took the TAP equation and they compute a first complexity of the biosphere. And it's not e to the 10 to the 124th, it's 10 to the 10 to the 237th. Now that's an astonishing number. That number, e to 10 to the 10 to the 237th says, the complexity of our biosphere is vastly greater than the rest of the universe. Well, should we believe it? Maybe, um, for reasons that I'll tell you, I'm gonna call that the Cortez number. So there's two things about this Cortez number. The first is, is it really larger than e to the 10 to the 124th? That would mean that the biosphere really has more complexity than the rest of the universe. And the next thing is, how, so is it really 2 to the 237 or 122? Or, you know, what, what's the actual number? I don't have time to answer, but say it fast. I'm just wondering, what are you measuring when you're saying complexity by those two numbers? What? What is, what is complexity by those numbers? It's the configuration space. Configuration space. Mm -hmm. Or the X, yeah. Okay. So that's derived. So now here's the implications for cosmology. Some of you know that there's a problem with the past hypothesis. So let me say what the past, the problem is. Um, we assume the Newtonian paradigm, which is of a fixed phase space. I'll, I, I better tell you the Newtonian paradigm right now. So here, here's what Newton does and teaches us to do. Identify the relevant variables, position and momentum. Having identified the relevant variables, write differential equations that couple them, the three laws of motion and universal gravitation. Skip universal gravitation right now. Fixed boundary conditions, that's fundamental. It's the billiard table. And once you fix the boundary conditions, that specifies all possible combinations of the positions and the momentum, right? You have fixed and pre-stated the phase space. That's central to everything that's in the Newtonian paradigm. You must be able to pre-state a fixed unchanging phase space. That's all the possibilities. So given that phase space, define the initial conditions, integrate the equations, which is to deduce their consequences, and you get an entailed trajectory in that phase space. So that's all classical physics, and it's all quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, you get a deterministic uh, evolution of a probability distribution, and then you actualize it however you want to. So that's the Newtonian paradigm. Given it, the past hypothesis assumes the universality of the paradigm. And now we've got the problem. If the universe is of a given complexity now, then the initial state must have been the reciprocal of that, so that the universe got more complex. That's the past hypothesis. And the question is, what's the price of the past hypothesis? And it's one over e to the 10 to the 124. And Penrose says, how did God do that? And so he has this wonderful cartoon of God trying to squeeze the initial states down into this enormously entropically reduced state for the initial conditions. Well, okay, here's the Cortez number. If, if the Cortez number is right, the price for the initial state is not the reciprocal of that, it's the reciprocal of that, which is vastly smaller. So what do we do with the Cortez number? We just ignore it, okay. We say, fine, I'll pay the price. Then Roger is even more miserable. So do we have any other choices? And we do. And the other choice, since this depends upon the universality of the Newtonian paradigm in the second law, just abandon the universality of the Newtonian paradigm in the second law, which is what I'm going to do. This is a radical step. 
So let me go on. So, but it may work. So again, the Newtonian paradigm requires a fixed and pre-stated phase space. That's what I'm challenging. The evolving bio biosphere for 2 billion years has created vastly many new in the universe possibilities. It may be as large as 10 to the 10 to the 237th. Hold that in mind. If this is true, if Marina's claim is true, the biosphere has created an enormous number of possibilities. The phase space are possibilities. And Paul Davies shows that it does not conflict with the causal closure of microphysics. In a paper in 2004, he calculates that if the universe started when it did, and there's a maximum rate of decisions, the universe can have carried out something like 10 to the 10 to the 120 or 122 decisions. And Paul writes, anything that exists that couldn't be calculated or created in 10 to the 20, 120 or 122 decisions could be emergent and not harm the causal closure of classical physics. Then he says proteins longer than 60 do it, and nucleotide sequences longer than a few hundred do it. So Paul is saying emergence is possible and it doesn't destroy the closure of classical physics or physics. So emergence is possible, Paul is saying. The Cortez number is saying it must be real. So I'm going to take it. Now I'm going to get to this fourth law. It's very, very strange. So let's go back to the liter box of gas and Boltzmann. So it's, it's a liter box of gas. The box is fixed. And we all know you've got n particles. Each particle is a classical particle. Its position can be described in three space with three numbers. Its momentum can be described with three numbers. So six numbers specify the position and momentum of each particle in the box. You've got n particle. It's a six n dimensional famous phase space and it's fixed. So all possible combinations of position and momentum in the box are there. And you get statistical mechanics by the ergodic hypothesis, where you give up integrating Newton's equations and you assert the system spends equal time and equal volumes, and you have take the logarithm of defined macrostates as a collection of microstates, which are tiny six n dimensional boxes, and macrostates. So macrostates with more microstates will have the property the system spends more time in them, and therefore you get the second law that the system will just ergodically do that. And by the way, it's critical in statistical mechanics that the time average of the system is identical to the ensemble average over all, all the boxes. Okay. So how will we deal with a non-ergodic system? It, it's never going to occupy all of its phase space. So we have to invent something new. How will we think about a system that will never be ergodic, say in the lifetime of the universe or multiples of that? So here's the move I'm making. And if you buy it, I think you're forced to the conclusion. So let me say it and see if you buy it. So David, destroy it, okay? So how can we define the phase space for a non-ergodic system that's making an expanding phase space? The natural, I claim, concept of the phase space of a non-ergodic system is to count all the possibilities that might have occurred at any time t. So that's all the possibilities that might have occurred. Call this PT. In general, some subset of all these possibilities at that time, PT, will actually occur, call the actualized subset PA. So if you buy that, we're gonna define the phase space of a non-ergodic system by counting all that could have occurred, then we're gonna consider all that did occur, PT and PA, then we're going to define the non-ergodicity of the system at time t as a ratio of all that could have occurred divided by what did occur, pt over pa. If you do that, then the localization of the system at time t is a reciprocal of that. So once you do that, we can move forward. Well, to move forward, that's neat. But if we had something about the temporal variation of, where is it? The temporal variation of all the possibles of subset non ergodicity and localization, we could have a fourth law for which we need some new law. So the, the, the TAP equation on my shirt is the first 
It's just a candidate for its law. So let's use it. And what you get to is this equation. So now consider setting alpha equal to one. So if alpha is one, one to any power says one, right? So alpha squared is one, alpha n is one. So if you get alpha one, this thing generates all the possibilities. It explodes incredibly rapidly. It's, it's what Marina calls a tetration. So but that's all the possibilities. If it's an alpha less than one, it creates a subset of those. Okay? So I've defined PT and I've defined PA. So well, we've just done it. It's always true that the actualized possible is less than the total possibles. So R, which is that ratio, is a non ergicity and one over that's the localization. It's terribly important that this fits the condition that we could say the following the phase space or time average is always less than the ensemble average. I can define that later if you want to see. But that's the opposite of ergodic systems. So we're in the ensemble when the, um, oh, and it's easy to show that this thing fits the ensemble which fits the conditions of what's called representability in Wikipedia, if we want to come back to it, but it does. So that says we could define a phase space. Well, now what? So here's the fourth law that Lee, Marina, Andrew, and I got to. All, everything increases. The non ergodicity non the non increases because this increases, they all increase in time. So that's the fourth law. That says that the phase space is expanding, but the non ergodicity of the system is increasing in time. Therefore, the reciprocal of it is also increasing in time. So the system is becoming ever more localized in its expanding phase space. We can now ask a new question. In ordinary statistical mechanics, the phase, yeah? How can both R and one over R increase? Because I'm calling one the non ergodicity and I'm calling the other lo the localization. If R is getting bigger, one over R is getting smaller. Of course. So it's not increasing. But I mean by one over R the localization, which is one over R, and the localization, how squeezed down it is, is increasing. It's a semantic thing, right? You're just I'm just saying the localization is increasing. Okay, so now we can ask a new question. In ordinary statistical mechanics, the box is fixed. There's no notion of the box doing anything to change the box. So we can ask a new question. How much work is done to expand the phase space? It's a legitimate new question we cannot ask in a fixed phase space. So I'm going to, so roughly I want to say, we don't really know, but a simple assumption is that the cost of adding a new thing is something like linear in its mass. If it was quadratic in its mass, it doesn't matter. But there's a scaling law in biology that some of us know, which is in fact, the number of heartbeats scales is math to the three fourth power. So the number of heartbeats of a hummingbird is the same as the number of heartbeats in an elephant per lifetime, suggesting that this is sublinear. Uh, all I need is, is that it's something like linear or even polynomial. And the reason is the expansion of those phase space by a tap can be hyperbolic. It does that, right? So when you add a new thing, the number of new, what's happening is that when you add a new thing in tap, the number of new possibilities can explode. Not, not down here, but when it's going up, yes? Or if it's exponential, because you're making the phase space bigger by making longing, longer um, polymers. So adding one new thing to tap from 40 to 41 makes mt plus one get a lot bigger. So the possibilities are exploding very, very fast when you add something. But this is very strange, so we've got to take this in too. You're allowing me for the moment to get away with defining the phase space of the system of everything that might have occurred, and we consider what actually did occur. But then no work was done to construct all of the things that didn't ever occur, right? No work. So the universe didn't get disturbed to create all of the things that didn't occur, that are places where energy could have been stored but aren't. Once you say that, it follows. That the biosphere constructs itself into an ever smaller subregion of its phase space, of its expanding phase space, 
but it did no work beyond constructing PA to make PT. It did no work to make the phase space expand. It just built itself. That means that the localization of the system in its expanding phase space is increasing and no compensating work was done to do that. If you let me get away with the first part, which is the phase space is all that might have occurred. And that means that the entropy of the system is going down. If I'm not sure that it's entropy, the local is, I, I'm, I'm quite sure it's entropy, but that's very strange if you buy that. If the Cortez number is larger than the complexity of the universe, and you buy all of this, you're stuck with the fact that the entropy of the universe has decreased. And that means that the error of time can't be, the, I mean, an increase in entropy can't be the cosmic error of time. So this is all really weird. It could be torn apart, David, uh, and defended, and all that. Now I'm gonna to change topics and I'm doing okay. And that's to get to this third transition in science. So what are the implications for biology? The complexity of the abiotic universe, let's say, is e to the 10 to the 124th. If we buy the Cortez number or something like it, the complexity of the biosphere is 10 to the 10 to the 237th or the 200, some huge number. That huge number here is huge compared to this. And there are all possibilities. Then the biosphere has constructed a whole bunch of possibilities. And our new question is how did the biosphere create this vastly many possibilities in 3.8 billion years. And what I'm going to be focusing our attention on, what I really think is a third transition of science, is how does the biosphere create ever expanding numbers of possibilities into which it becomes? And so does the global economy. It creates new ways, ever new ways of earning a living. It does it, it's doing in the last 20,000, in the past 200 years. What's happening that the evolving biosphere does that and can we mathematize it? So here's the third transition. It's, we claim, beyond Newton and quantum mechanics and the Newtonian paradigm, and it's in tail trajectories in a phase space. So Andrea and I are going to claim the evolution of the biosphere cannot be explained by physics alone. That we're confident of. The paper's in press, a third transition, and it's coming out April 14th, and it's online. Um, I'll do this fast. There's two theories of molecular reproduction. Template replicating RNA has been around for years. Uh, Leslie Orgel tried it. It's always failed. It might work. Um, somebody has now made a, a single-stranded RNA molecule that can template replicate another RNA molecule, a few hundred nucleotides, which is really neat. That view says that life starts with a new replicating gene. Suppose that we're right. That thing is going to have to make something to catalyze the metabolism of small molecules that supports it, right? Okay, so suppose that it does. I'm about to show you that living organisms, prokaryotes, have small molecule autocatalytic sets. There's no reason on this top view why a metabolism evolved for the new gene would not only be a metabolism, but would also be collectively autocatalytic. So let's get to that. The other view of the origin of life from uh, me in 1971 to now is that you can have collectively autocatalytic sets. So I catalyze the formation of Peter out of a couple of Peter parts. Peter catalyzes the formation of Nobuto out of a couple of Nobuto parts, and he catalyzes the formation of a couple of Stu parts. They exist, as I'll show you. That's a collectively autocatalytic set. They exist. There are peptide autocatalytic sets, I'll show you, RNA autocatalytic sets. And stunningly, uh, Joanna Xavier has found small molecule autocatalytic sets in all 6,700 prokaryotes. There's no polymers, there's no DNA, there's no RNA, and there's no proteins. There's small molecule autocatalytic sets. Joan has led a group of us, and she's now shown them in all RK and all bacteria. They all have small molecule autocatalytic sets. I'm lucky enough to be on the paper, but Joanna did the work. All prokaryotes have small molecule collectively autocatalytic sets with no polymers. That, I just find that stunning. I think it's the most important work on the origin of life in the last two decades. She's an amazing woman. So that's true. If you imagine that an RNA new gene evolves a metabolism, neat, why would it bother to be collectively autocatalytic? That's just nuts. So I think this is to date. Molecular reproduction has only been achieved with collectively autocatalytic sets. 
And my bet is, Joanna has told us, and I have, that that's how molecular reproduction started in the universe. So on the left is a theory that I did with Norm Packard and uh, John Farmer in 1986. Uh, we made a model in which polymers can catalyze reactions forming polymers. This is a diagram. It's got molecules and reactions. Every molecule is connected to reactions, and every reaction is connected to molecules. And dotted arrows show that this molecule catalyzes that reaction. The fundamental idea is that molecules are combinatorial objects. As you increase the complexity of the objects, the diversity of reactions among them goes up faster than the number of molecules. There are more reactions than there are molecules. So do anything, any, any nutty theory of who catalyzes what, like everybody's got a uniform probability of catalyzing anything or power or whatever. And I have shown and like Seal shown, we've all shown that at some diversity, you just get a phase transition to collect the bottom catalysis. Uh, that's been now published in various forms for 50 years. So meanwhile, Bonan Ashkenazi has this in, in the Ben Gurion. It's nine peptides that mutually catalyze one another's formation. So peptide one takes two fragments of peptide two and glues it together and so on around this set. It re-reproduces. Molecular autocatalytic sets have been formed out of peptides and out of RNA. And Joanne is finding them on the computer as small molecules, not yet in the web. Okay, I want to turn to a different thing. Uh, so we've got collective autocatalysis. I want to get to constraint closure. And the problem has to do with work. So Dave is a physicist, and I, I bet if you, I asked you what work is, the standard answer is force acting through a distance. Then Atkin comes along and says, nah, it's more interesting. Work is the constrained release of energy into a few degrees of freedom. So there's the canon. My firmer went through that. That's a canon, and there's a clue that says canon, and there's a cannonball. And there's power, and when power explodes, the cannon is the constraint, the boundary condition. It constrains the explosion from being spherical and blasts the cannonball out and does work on the cannonball. That is the constraint release of energy. And so the physicist chief, forgive me, David, you put in fixed and moving boundary conditions and solve it. So I get, okay, no constraints, no work. And being naive, I thought, you know, at the Big Bang, there were no cannons. Well, where did the cannon come from? It took work. So it takes work to make constraints, or sometimes does, and it always takes constraints to make work. Uh oh, how do they all get hooked together? I, I got as far as constraints to make work that makes constraints, and I didn't know what to do. And in 2015, Mateo Mosio and Mael Monteo, no, <laughs> sorry. Mayan Motivilla and Matteo Mosio solved it. And this is, if you get nothing else, you get their idea. Don't, yeah, don't read this blue stuff, I'll explain it. Well, we want to get some work, so we need some non equilibrium processes. That there be three non equilibrium processes one, two, and three. To get work, we need some constraints A, B, and C. So just hear me. And I kind of imagine the picture saying it here. A constrains the release of energy in process one, and that makes a B. B constrains the release of energy in process two, and that makes C. C constrains the release of energy in process three, and, and it makes an A. So hold it. Think what this says. This is a system where there are three constraints on the release of energy, A, B, and C. A constrains the release of energy that makes a B. B constrains the release that makes a C, and blah, blah, blah. It's a set of cis constraints that constrain the release of energy to construct the very same constraints. Automobiles are full of the constrained release of energy, but they don't construct the constraints, right? Cells do. That's constraint closure. It's astonishing. They did it. It changes everything in all kinds of ways. So let me now show you that a collectively autocatalytic set also achieves automatically constraint closure. So there's this one and there's this one. Well, how does this work? This protein binds two fragments of that protein and holds them in place. Doing so 
orients them in space. So it lowers the activation energy to ligate them because they're not floating around in food space. Then it actually constructs them and makes a peptide bond and does work. So this thing making a second copy of that out of the two fragments has actually done the constraining release of energy and work to construct the next thing. So this peptide is a boundary condition that does, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is itself a boundary condition constraint that constrains the release of energy to construct the next peptide, which is a boundary condition constraint. It looks all the way around the set. So it achieves constraint closure as well. This is just transformative. It's both auto collectively auto catalytic and it achieves constraint closure. So now I'm going to show you Joanna's set. She has shown, and I'm on the paper, all 6,700 prokaryotes have collectively auto catalytic sets. Her bet is that this is a universal ancestor to all life and all molecular reproduction. And my bet is that it arose as a phase transition probably all over the universe about four or five billion years ago, because there were stars and there were planets and so on. And I think the next statement is true. These three closure, catalytic closure, constraint closure, and work task closure, which I think is, is also task closure or organizational closure, Matthew, that is the non-mystical form of the Elan Vital. This is, this is Dylan Thomas's green fuse that drives the flower. There's nothing mystical about it. This organization of process fundamentally is life. It's not reproducing yet. That's it. Okay. Now, so I need to get all, I'll manage to finish, I guess, by 12, or about what the hour. So we need now the notion of a Kantian whole. This is wonderful. He said this in 1780. He says, look, an organized being has the property that the parts exist for and by means of the whole. So I'm going to call that a Kantian whole. It's Kant's idea. We're all Kantian wholes. You exist because you have livers and kidneys and spleens, and they exist because they're part of you and you exist. So we're all Kantian wholes, but that's a Kantian whole also. Each peptide gets to continue to exist because it's part of the whole autocatalytic set. So the parts exist for and by means of the whole set. A collectively autocatalytic set is a Kantian whole. Now, once you've done that, we could do a bunch of things. The function of a part is that some set of its causal properties that supports the whole. The function of your heart is pumping blood, not marking, making heart sounds. The function of the peptide is to catalyze the next reaction, not jiggle water in the pericardial space. So we've got a non-circular definition of function. The next thing is really important. Selection acts on the level of the whole, and by doing so, it indirectly selects for its ever-evolving parts. Selection acts at the level of the whole organism, and it selects it for its evolving parts. So selection is downward causation. Therefore, the explanatory arrows point upward. This is strong emergence, as we will see, and peace to Weinberg and Kaku have the God equation. No. Selection acts downward on evolving organisms, and that will turn out to be strong emergence. Okay, so let me expand on that. The universe is not ergodic and getting to exist. Well, how can I persuade you of that? Well, how many proteins are there length 200? There's 20 amino acids. So the number of proteins length 200 is 20 to the 200th, which is 10 to the 260, which is a real big number. So if you calculate the fastest time scale is the Planck time scale of 10 to the minus 40 or 30 seconds. The universe is about 10 to the 30, 13 seconds old. And if you imagine that the 10 to the 80 particles in the universe are doing nothing on the Planck time scale, but making proteins of that length, it would take the age of the universe range to 10 to the 37th power to make them all once. And that means something physical. It means the universe in vastly longer than the lifetime of the universe will never make all possible proteins like 200, let alone 2000. So the universe is vastly not ergodic it turns out at levels above about $500. But that means something really fundamental. It's really true that most things that are complex will never get to exist. They just won't. But the human heart exists. It's about 300 grams and it pumps blood. And it exists. We've all got them. So we have a new question. How can this possibly be true that hearts exist? And the answer is 
that because we're living entities, we're Kantian wholes, and the parts exist for and by means of the whole. So selection acting on the whole indirectly selects for the parts with improved functions. So early hearts, parts emerge and evolve to function better. This is saying the Kantian holes, namely hearts evolve to sustain us better. And those with better hearts have more kids, okay? So this is fundamental. Hearts exist in the universe by virtue of their function. If hearts didn't have the function of pumping blood and sustaining Kantian holes, hearts would not exist. So functions are real in the universe. Therefore, we cannot explain the existence of hearts in the universe without both the physics that allows hearts to exist and the selection for functioning of hearts by virtue of which hearts exist in the universe. And because that's true, like it or not, physics alone will not explain the evolution of the biosphere. Well, reductionism in its radical form fails. Now, I have time to tell you this thing that Andre and I did. It's a, it'll take a little bit, it's sort of strange. We can use no mathematics based on set theory to deduce the ever new possibilities and new functions that emerge in the evolving biosphere. Thus, we cannot deduce the ever changing phase space of the evolving biosphere. The evolving biosphere is beyond the Newtonian paradigm. So I have to talk about the uses of things. There's this lovely idea of affordances. So defined by a psychologist some years ago who says, I can use, no, a horizontal surface affords me a place to sit. An affordance is, I, I can use X to accomplish Y. I can use a horizontal surface to, fit, to sit. So affordances are relative to me. They're not objective properties of the world. They're of use to me, and they involve uses of things. Uses of things is not part of physics, but uses of things are part of biology. So let me switch to uses of things like, like tools. So for years, I was in love with screwdrivers. It's a sexual predilection. So here we are, and we're often, I hand you a screwdriver, and I say to, to my friend, Peter, you don't have to answer me. Um, tell me all the things you can do with the screwdriver by itself or with other things. So I've done a bunch of this, so I can say, you can screw in a screw, you can unscrew it, you can wedge a door closed, you can wedge a door open, you could scrape putty off the uh, off the window, uh, you could stab an assailant, it's an objet de art, but you can also tie it to a stick and spear a fish, and you can rent the spear, and I'll finish with, you can lean the, the screwdriver against the wall, put a piece of plywood on top of it, and put a wet oil paint, keep the rain off of it, and can we list all the uses of a screwdriver alone with other things? Can we list them? Is the number of uses of a screwdriver some specific number like three or 17? We'll kind of know. Is it infinite or unknown? How, how would we know? The number of uses of a screwdriver is indefinite. But if you buy that, it doesn't map to the real language. Or perhaps it's unknown. I mean, nobody could have used a screwdriver 400 years ago to shorten an electric circuit. How do we know what we'll do with a screwdriver 2,000 years ago? So it took me years, this is really funny. It took me until about two years ago to say, yeah, well, what about engine blocks? So let's try engine blocks. You all know what an engine block is. It's a chunk of steel and you drill holes in. So what can you use an engine block for? You can drill holes in it and make cylinders and make an engine. But Andre is in, Andre is in Italy. He says, you can drill the holes and store wine. But then I know that an engine block is rigid and you can use it for the chassis of a tractor, which is how tractors are made. And then with an enormous leap, I realized you could use an engine block as a paperweight. And with a further stunning stump, I said, you know, you, the engine block's got sharp corners. You can crack open coconuts. Several things. Can we list all the uses of an engine block? No, because they have screwdrivers. If I know that I can use the engine block to, as a paperweight, can I deduce, I can use this object to crack open coconuts? Well, no, it could have been a, an old banana skin, right? That means something profound. From the use of the engine block as a paperweight, there's no way to deduce its other uses in general. It's not, not deductive. But that means that the coming to exist of these other uses can't be deduced. And that's what's happening in Darwinian pre-adaptations, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, 
and the uses of things are just it's a nominal scale. There's no ordering relationship. So here's what Andre and I got about a year and a half ago. I, I, I said, there's something funny about the axiom of choice, this wacky axiom of choice. And Andre's now we're looking, we looked up set theory. And the first axiom of set theory is the axiom of extensionality. Here it is. Two sets are identical if and only if they contain the same members. OK. But I cannot prove that the uses of a screwdriver are identical to the uses of an engine block. I can certainly prove that they're not identical. I cannot prove that they're identical because I can't complete the list of all the uses of an engine block or all the uses of, of a screwdriver. Since I can't complete the list of either of these, I don't have the axiom of extensionality. So I don't have set theory. And that means a bunch of things. Can we get numbers? Well, there's two ways to get number. Russell said the set, the set of the number two is identical to all sets with exactly two members. Well, that in the biosphere is a set of all things that have exactly two uses. No. The number zero is a set of all things with exactly zero members. So zero is a set of all things that have exactly zero uses. We can't get one, two, three, zero. So we can't get one plus one is equal to two. We cannot get one plus x is equal to n, so we can't get equations, so we can't get lines, we can't get quadratic equations, we can't get equations that are only solved uh, by taking the square root of minus one, so we can't get complex numbers, so we can't get vector spaces, we can't get quaternions, we can't get Hilbert space, we can't get spaces at all, we can't even do the intersection and union of two sets. We can't do the union of two sets because we don't know what's in each one because they're not sets. We can't do the intersections, can't do logic. That means we're at a spot where you can't use any of the mathematics based on set theory. That means we can't write differential equations. And if we could, we can't use the axiom of choice, choice, which depends upon well ordering. So even if we could write equations, we couldn't integrate them and take limits. The conclusion is you cannot use set theory to deduce the new uses of things in the evolution of the biosphere. You can't. And so that's our major claim. So we can't use set theory. I'm almost done. And about a year ago, this struck Andre and me. It's really striking. So I'm going to take my time. I'm going to show you that the emergence of the biosphere isn't engineering. So just pause. Consider a bacterium. It's a Kantian whole. Selection acts on the whole. Now, think of a protein. What can a protein do? Well, it can absorb a photon, it can conduct an electron, it can bind a ligand, it can catalyze a reaction, it can carry a tension load or compression load. It can be a structure on which a molecular motor walks, blah, 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 blah. So every molecule in a bacterium, the thousands of molecules, they stand ever ready to be co-opted for some unused causal consequences that could be used for some new non-deducible function. Uh, for example, your lens protein evolved from, from enzymes. And uh, Jordan has cases of, uh, of proteins evolving to do wacky new things in viruses. It happens all the time. That means every molecule in that bacterium could get co-opted for some wacky new function, right? Then you're going to go, wait a minute. Selection acts on the whole set. Therefore, whatever these new functions are, they better be integrated to serve the Kantian whole, otherwise they won't be selected. That's how the biosphere does it, you guys. The biosphere is forever finding new uses of things that function in the Kantian whole. We cannot have deduced them. The biosphere is inventing new ways of getting to exist in ways we can't even pre-state, let alone predict, let alone deduce. And it's doing it faster than we literally can say. That's emergence. It is in fact strong emergence. Um, as precisely because selection acts to the level of the whole, it's not you do so, it's strong emergence. It's not the weak emergence physicists love, and I do too, like for example, a ferromagnet at the theory temperature where you get power on distributions and stuff. And it's not even Phil Anderson's new laws arising at a higher level that you can't reduce to the lower level. There's no laws. This is strong emergence precisely because Kantian holes 
the chief constraint closure and selection acts at the level of the whole. So we confront a world of strong emergence. And I'm going to end here. We're beyond the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Well, one more slide after this. Ever new uses of old molecules keep happening. This is part, this is part of what I wanted to get at, Jordan. Can we find lots and lots of examples where the same molecule finds a new use, even without mutations? And therefore, these are creating ever new possibilities in the universe. So the ever new uses of old molecules can't be deduced. The evolving bias here is a non-deducible propagating construction because of constraint closure. It's not an entailed deduction, period. It's not. So we get to the following a hypothesis. So a whole bunch of us who are fascinated with the idea of dynamical criticality, the edge of chaos, and all kinds of grounds of things. It's known that genetic regulatory networks are critical, so is brain. Um, and there are grounds to think that organisms should evolve to be mutually critical because they can do the most complex things. So this, that's a wonderful broad hypothesis, sort of the criticality hypothesis. The further hypothesis, here's all these cells and they're dynamically critical. Could we prove that dynamically critical evolving biosphere enables the optimum creation and seizing of new bubbles of possibilities. Namely, can we test this? And one way is the soil system. I'm gonna end with that. So uh, my friend Jan Dijksterhuis in Holland and I are doing the 40, 100, 140 species experiment. I'd have thought it was done, but it hasn't. So we are taking 70 genotype fungi and 70 genotype bacteria. And we're gonna mix them together. We have a grant, Jan Dijkstra, and we're gonna plate out aliquots on 50 independent sterilized soils and just let them evolve for a year. What will happen? Nobody's ever asked the question. So question one, do they evolve and then stop evolving? If they stop evolving at a terminal community, is it the same for all 50? Do the 50 go to different terminal communities? Meanwhile, it's dawned on me and Jan, we can't pre-state the adjacent possibles, but if mutations happen that capture them, afterwards we could find the mutations that happen and look back and see, as I was saying to you, Jordan, what proteins without being mutated uh, or with mutations have what new functions. So we can see how the expanding biosphere creates and captures new possibilities. And then we can start with slightly different initial populations, see they go to the same. Is, is there a community that's a, an attractor? And then I want to do another experiment with Jan. Culture one species, two species, five species, 10 species, 20 species, 30, 40, 50. Together. Nobody's ever done this for a fixed period of time, say a year, and count the total number of mutations that have accumulated. That's doable. You just take it into one shot screening of it. Does the number of mutate, how does the number of mutations accumulated? scale with the number of species. It might be linear in the number of species. I bet it's not. I bet the co-evolving species are creating ever new niches for one another by which they get to exist. You can't restate the adjacent possible of a biosphere, but if we do an experiment like that, and I think Jan and I will be able to do it, we can see what happened. Maybe we will find that the number of, of mutations that accumulates goes like tap, slowly and then it just explodes. Who knows? Or maybe it's quadratic of the number of species or fourth order. Nobody's done it. We can actually see how the biosphere is creating new possibilities as multiple things co-evolve with one another, which is like the global economy creating new possibilities. So this closes out as, I think there's a fourth law. I think we're at a transition and it's to begin to understand how the evolving life creates non-prestatable and non-deducible new possibilities and seizes them, the actual and the non-deducible adjacent possible. It ends with, profoundly, we're of nature, not above nature. Western science is places above nature, since Nova Morgana in 1560 or whenever that was. It's, it's, it's the doctrine of domination. Adam's here on earth, given the earth all in it to, for his purposes. And Western science is all about dominating nature. You're not going to dominate the biosphere. It's inventing itself faster than you can say it. We're just wrong and arrogant, wasteful, and we're destroying the biosphere. So thanks.